I don't know what happened between Trimble's generation and mine, but I feel like I didn't eat as well as I should have, or I should be taller. Um, anyway, masicho shi'i for your words this morning. Um, really uh, special, um, some of the things that he shared. So um, a few weeks ago, President Joseph called me and asked if I'd be willing to co-keynote with my uncle, Trimble. And I said, sure, how much time do we have to speak? And he said, oh, I don't know, three to four hours. <laughs> I think he was trying to scare me. But then I thought, you know, does he know who he's asking? We got two Gutin, one's an elder, one's a college professor. We could be at this mic all day and still be jigging all night long. <laughs> So, Van Gwinzi Shalak Nai, Shojrit Charlene Sternoji, Shiahan Nai, Florence Newmans at Peter Stern, Shitsu Shitsiha, James and Maggie Gilbert, Arctic Village, Gwitsan, Alfred and Barbara Aichan, Berkeley, California, Shiju Chan Grace and Oji, Arctic Village, Vatsan Ithi, Ga Fairbanks, Gwichi. Aaron mentioned uh, the tradition of naming, um, and so I wanted to just quickly follow up on that. Um, my son is half Navajo, and when he was born, um, it came to my mom to, to give him his name, and it was really um, difficult because um, some of the words in our language mean something completely different in Navajo. And one time she was considering naming him Tijin, which in our language means eagle. A really proud, strong name. And so we brought that up with the other side of the family. And it turns out Chijin sounds too much like Chiji, which is uh, in Navajo means dry elbows. <laughs> and I thought, he's never going to be able to be the president of the Navajo Nation with a name like that. <laughs> So um, anyway, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored to be addressing all of you. Uh, yesterday, I was watching the meetings through the live stream, and I was so proud of the young people that came up here and shared what the theme of this year's conference means to you. And I want them to know that it really took me until I was in college, so I was in my mid-20s before I became actively engaged in the region. And so I'm so proud of you guys for getting an early start and for developing your uh, leadership skills now. So I want to give you guys a hand for that. In preparation for this talk, I read some of the minutes from the meeting that took place in 1915 between the chiefs and Judge Wickersham. And I thought that given that it's been 100 years since that meeting, um, but also the theme of this year's conference, Stronger Together for the Next 100 Years, I'd like to offer some of my thoughts on how we can collectively move forward towards that future. I want you all in the room to know that I recognize the fact that I don't have the extensive experience in tribal governance and administration that many of you do. But I do share um, the concerns about many of the issues that you care about. And uh, as a younger tribal uh, member from the region, I, I thought I'd just give you some of the thoughts that I think about. Um, in my current role as a college professor teaching rural development, I have the honor of working with students, many of which are Alaska Native and some that actually come from the TCC region. Most of these students are there to explore what they can do to make a positive impact in rural communities. Um, and it really makes me feel good and hopeful about the future to work with these students because I really believe we're in a time of really great transition. Um, in the rural development program, what we do is we try to prepare students to be leaders of change. But what I do uh, often share with my students is something that an author named Jay Stewart Black wrote about, which is that there are three inconvenient truths about change. The first is that change is hard. The second is that change is expensive. And third is that change takes time. As if those truths weren't challenging enough, there is also the fact that today, the rate of change is faster than it has ever been before, the magnitude and size of change is greater, and that change is near impossible to predict. So what does this mean for those of us here in the room? To me, it means that we must do all we can to prepare for an unknown future, which in some ways is the same yet very uh, different challenge that our ancestors faced. For the past couple years, I've been slowly working towards my PhD, which requires me to do research in a, in a field that I'm interested in. I chose to study how the people of my area, Arctic Village and Vinitai, used to prepare and make decisions about their survival when they still lived in camps, as well as how they made decisions about their communities once they began settling into villages. 
I've become convinced through this process that the traditional knowledge and set of practices that they use can be transferred to today. In my region, as Trumbull and other elders in this room know much better than I, our ancestors used to move camp from place to place throughout the year. And at every, any given time of year, our people used to know where the best places were to find caribou, whitefish, muskrat. And they used that knowledge to dictate their movements in a very strategic way. No one would ever pick up their family to move 50 below, in 50 below weather unless they were pretty sure that there was some kind of resources that awaited them wherever they were going. There was a lot, always a lot at stake in a country as harsh as ours. The weather could turn for the worst. The caribou could change migration. The people could easily starve. There were always unknowns, but the key was preparing as much as they could for the unexpected. That same philosophy of forward thinking and preparation can help us to today. No one has the ability to predict what lies ahead, but we know from the stories of our elders that times will get tougher. We've probably all heard this before and are starting to see some of that happening now with climate change, energy, and the violence that's happening across the world. Many of the factors that affect our communities today are outside of our control. They may even be outside of the control of state and federal governments. This new reality presents a very challenging situation, not just for our communities, but for all communities across the world. And unfortunately, I don't have any great answers. I do, however, believe that there are two strategies that can help us navigate an uncertain future. Those two strategies are grit and sovereignty. And the good news is we have both of them at our fingertips. You start the PowerPoint, Greg. So um, the first strategy is something that psychologist Angela Duckworth refers to as grit. Grit is sticking with things over time, over the very long term, until you master them. We can also think of grit as perseverance. So this psychologist became interested in the relationship between grit and success. As it turns out, grit is a personality trait that some people have more than others, but it is necessary to achievement in any field. As part of the research, a team tested uh, students entering college, individuals entering management programs, and cadets entering West Point, the military academy. At the beginning of these programs, they tested their IQs and also their scores on a test that measured their grit. From these results, they tried to predict which of those individuals would be most successful in their training programs. What they found was that when it came to success and high achievement, grit mattered more than intelligence, more than leadership ability, and more than physical fitness. I mention this because we also think, can think of grit as the ability to commit to something and be disciplined about achieving it, which is nothing new to our people. If our ancestors didn't have grit, we wouldn't be here today. It's that simple. So why am I sharing this? I believe that it is critically important that we as parents and as family members make it a priority to teach our young ones to be grittier. And I know that word sounds funny, but grit will help our young people to navigate not only the Western education system, but also life in general. And although I have never served as a tribal, elected tribal leader, I would imagine that one might need a fair amount of grit to be effective in that role as well. So I want to credit both of my parents for teaching me grit, and this happened both through encouragement and also discipline. I'm going to share a quick story with you real quick. So um, when I was in high school, you could say that I didn't exactly take school seriously. I um, got into the bad habit of skipping school, and I thought I was so sneaky, but I didn't know that the district started leaving automated messages on my dad's um, voicemail, and they also started sending him letters in the mail. So, like any good parent, my dad waited for the perfect opportunity to teach me a lesson. One day, he caught me skipping school and seemed oddly okay with it, which is, should have been my cue that something was up. So, anyway, he encouraged me to go for a little ride with him, and I happily hopped in the car thinking we were going to get something to eat. Boy, was I ever wrong. How many of you in here are afraid of needles? <laughs> Okay, how many of you are really afraid of shots? <laughs> oh, come on, I know there's more of you. <laughs> okay, so that was me, terrified of needles, terrified of getting shots. So before I even knew what was happening, my dad drove me to the clinic and told the front desk that I was due for my tetanus shot. I didn't even get a chance to explain that I'd never stepped on a rusty nail <laughs> before the nurse had a big uh, needle in my arm. 
So my arm was really sore for days, but in the end, I guess that um, I should consider myself lucky because that was really the only wake-up call that I needed. I didn't need to go to jail. I didn't need to get bailed out of anywhere. I just needed a tetanus shot to set me straight. <laughs> so it took me a long time to realize how lucky I was to have parents that really made sure I had the grit that I needed to finish what I started. So I want to ask my parents to just stand up to just acknowledge them, wherever they are. There's my mom, Florence Newman. Where's my dad? Oh, <laughs> my dad's filming this in back. Okay, so the importance of grit was also reinforced at home in Arctic Village. As you probably know, the people of Arctic Village and Vinitai spent many years fighting to protect their homeland, which led to the establishment of the Vinitai Indian Reserve that covers 1.8 million acres. From a young age, tribal sovereignty, protecting our way of life, doing things in a good way were all teachings that were indoctrinated into us. Our people frequently talked about the fight to protect what we have and that giving up was never an option on the table. There were several of us at the time, and I don't exactly recall, but we, um, we were interning for the tribe one summer. And I don't remember ever being given a job description for an intern, but I'm pretty sure if it was, it would have been one line, which was, your job is to do whatever Gideon James tells you to do. <laughs> so one, one summer, he had me and another intern, Marguerite Gimmel, who has since been our chief and our tribal administrator. Uh, he had us do all the household income surveys for HIP. You guys probably know what HIP is, the Housing Improvement Program. And I just remember that she and I, uh, we were so young and didn't really know what we were doing, but we started off at the very top of our village and we stopped at every house on the way down. And you know how nice our people are. At every house we stopped at, they gave us a cup of coffee. And it wasn't that weak kind of coffee either. <laughs> it was that strong, grow your hair on your chest kind of coffee. Anyway, I swear I was up for like two to three days um, from all that caffeine. But we were so scared of Gideon that we just kept going. And by golly, we were going to finish that survey. So grit is important in a lot of different ways. Um, we'll move to the second slide. But grit, I believe, is, um, is one strategy. The, st the second strategy that can really help us to prepare for an un uh, unknown future is to expand our spheres of control and influence over critical factors. And we can think of that like the slide up here shows. There's a circle, and that innermost circle represents all of the things that are within our community's control. The second circle represents all of those things that our communities may not control, but that are in our, our circle of influence. And then outside of those two circles are things that are not within our control and are not within our, our spheres of influence. I believe that at one point in time, our circles of control and influence over many aspects of our life were quite large. I also believe that over time with colonization, the fragmentation of our land base, and the many layers of institutions, laws, and policies that came with it, <clears throat> our circle of control and influence over critical areas has shrunk. The challenge in my mind is for communities to be able to decide for themselves what are those critical areas that need to be within those first two circles, and then how we can be very strategic in making that happen. One of the tools that I believe we have to expand our spheres of control and influence is our tribal sovereignty. <clears throat> we may not own um, much tribally owned land in our state yet, but what we do have are 229 tribal nations. That is a base of power that no other state in the U.S. contends with, not even by a long shot, which I think is why so many people get nervous when, we, when tribes talk about sovereignty. If I did my math right, the 42 villages in the TCC region represent almost 7.5 of all federally recognized, recognized tribes in the entire nation. Think about that. That's crazy. 7.5%. I firmly believe that our tribal nations in Alaska are every inch as important as the other nation we call the United States. That means that people like Mickey Stickman and Galen Gilbert are all, and all of you here in the front rows, are just as important as President Barack Obama. I even see some Hillary Clintons somewhere in the back. <laughs> 
But truly, that's how we have to start thinking of ourselves if our grandchildren have any chance of sitting here in, um, together 100 years from now, if they have any chance of eating salmon from the rivers or harvesting caribou and moose, if they have any chance of calling villages home. We have to start regarding ourselves as the 42 sovereign tribal nations that we are and who represent a people that have been here for thousands of years and who don't have plans to go anywhere. I believe that as we move into the next 100 years, we will, we will be better positioned if we stand together. Grit and sovereignty can take each one of us, um, each one of our tribes far, but not as far if we exercise those powers and that discipline towards a common vision for the region. I recently participated in the strategic planning work session that TCC held back in November and was so heartened to see the amount of work that went into that plan. I am a planner by training and so I've been really impressed with the level of commitment that TCC has shown for planning all the way from the executive level all the way down to the village level. Planning is a tool that can help us to better, um, be better organized and more strategic when it comes to limited resources. But it can also provide a pathway from where it is today to where we want to go in, that, uh, in the future. And if we don't have a vision for our own future, then somebody else will and it may not be good. So you see my uh, slide up here. I'm going to leave you with something that I always share with my students, which is a quote from the very wise man, Mike Tyson. And he says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I tell my students, think like a planner, but also be a strategist. It's important to have a clear, clear direction of where you're going, but be willing to adapt your strategies as needed to reflect what's going on in the external environment. And finally, if you ever do get sucker punched in the face, which I hope you never do, you better have a plan B or a very powerful right hook. <laughs> In closing, I just want to wish my uh, niece, Jana, a happy birthday. <laughs> She's waving. <laughs> happy birthday, Jana, and all the other St. Patty's Day babies. Um, I also want to say much seat cho to my Uncle Trimble for letting me share this moment with him. I also want to say much seat cho to President Joseph for inviting me to address you. But most importantly, I want to say thanks to all of you for listening to me. It's been a real honor, and I look forward to continuing to serve this region. Masit cho and keguada na'oli. God bless. <laughs>